I know that God's good. Amen. So when you got a good God, he's good when you ain't. He's bet God's better at God's better at everything than you are. And I know sometimes we don't see things God's way. We think some things ought to be done this way. It's the only way it can be done. That's our nature. Uh, I don't think we're born faithful. I think faith has to be given to us by God. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. And uh, if you don't have the word of God, you don't have no faith. Amen. Brother Brian came in uh, a little while ago and was told us that a church that him and his wife used to attend, a King James church, they decided to uh, fold up and close their doors. And a lot of it has to do with, and I've seen this, you bring people in, get them to know the Lord, and the devil's right there. He's either going to lure them back with their old sins or he's going to lure them away with false teachings false doctrine i we've seen that here we had it happen many times and that's that's just i think the way things go in this day and age i think i still think that few there be that find the narrow way and some people, in spite of that scripture, have it in their mind that they're going to save all these people and we're just going to take over the world and hand it to Jesus Christ for him to reign. I've heard that doctrine before. It's called kingdom now, post-millennialism or whatever. But it says that uh, the church is just going to conquer the world and save you know millions of people worldwide. And that's going to put down all of Christ's enemies and we're going to hand him the keys and say, here you go, you reign on earth. And I don't see that in the Bible. What I see is a mass apostasy taking place. And one church after another, they are either folding up or they're compromising and turning over so that they can draw in the crowd. I've had countless people over the years tell me, it's all, all past, we like your teaching, but you know, we go to such and such church, they got programs for the kids, they got, and I want to tell you something, who do you trust your kids with anymore, amen? But we got programs for the kids, and then we've got the coffee shop, and they've got that good music, and I really like that music now, but it's not right, it's not of God, and it's just drawing people away. So my heart goes out to any church that uh, is trying to stick with the word of God these days because you're not going to be you're not going to be big. It's very seldom that that happens. And I will say this, especially in urban areas. City folk, they don't think much about God and the Bible anymore. Still got a lot of country folk that do. But city folk, you don't find that anymore. So what a shame. What a time that we live in. Somebody say amen. First Peter chapter 4. Did you bring a Bible tonight? I hope so. If not, you got one there in the pew there. Open it up. Open up your phones. Open up your tablets. Whatever you have a Bible on. And I don't even mind you doing this. Now, if you got your phone or your tablet out or whatever. If you want to go on our where we're streaming on facebook if you want to go and like it and share it right now do it do it now because then that opens up yeah chris is going how in the world do you do that <laughs> yeah what is face a facebook is that a picture book with everybody's face in it i don't know why the guy called it that but anyway uh, like it, share it, because what you're doing is you're sharing what, I hear me. Way to go, Brian. Facebook.com slash Pastor Mike Online. And share that stream with your, because you know people that I don't know. And they know people that we don't know. 
And that's how evangelism works. It works by people knowing and evangelizing other people who they know. That's how it works. So I don't mind you doing that. Do what? What, you need money? Is that what it is? You're holding out for cash? I mean, I don't mind paying if that's what you're holding out on. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't know what it takes. Somebody help me out here. Who's? Oh, yeah, yeah, I got to remember that. Help me to remember when we have our prayer time. A good man of God, Pastor uh, Evangelist Doy Williamson, his wife, has they just found a tumor in her brain. So we're going to remember to pray for her. But somebody figure out what it takes to share. Maybe, I don't know, I don't know if you got to be on my friends list, but I don't think so. It's an open page. Huh? Okay. Because I... I'm on Facebook, but I'm not on Facebook. I get in too many fights. Amen. Anyway, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. Uh, let's back it up a little bit to verse 17. Uh, verse 16, actually. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come. The judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. If you have suffered over anything, over any situation, whether it's physical, spiritual, or emotional, if you are suffering or have suffered and you believe that it's not really directly related to some sin that God's chastising you over, then count yourself blessed because God is allowing it and God is, what He's doing, He's training you, He's making you tough or tougher than you used to be. How is it that I've got more skin on the end of my elbow than I do right here in my armpit? How is it that the skin is thicker here than it is here? Because this skin, you, Caleb? Right. This skin here is the foundation and basis for my forklift. Right? You like that? That's an old joke, but I, it works every time. This might, I operate a forklift for a living. But this skin is tough because it needs to be. It's the one that we use. It gets, this is, if we fall, God designed it automatically that we fall on our elbows or on the palms of our hands or something like that to protect our brain. Some of you. But that's why. This skin needs to be tough. And sometimes there's areas of life that God says you need to toughen up a little bit. Instead, you know, my mom got sick of me running to her every time I got picked on by the kids at school or the ones on the bus. And she was going to teach me how to fight. Didn't work too well, but she was going to. She said, son, you've got to stand up to some of these boys. At some point, you've got to take it or stand up to them. Quit running to me. My mom was very wise in that. And so God, I mean, God loves us for us to come to him. But David said, I worship the Lord that taught my hands how to fight. Learn how to fight a battle. Learn how to get a little tough around the edges. Learn how to, to God's purging you. God is taking you through things. He's making you battle ready. Because the first time around, it's an easy fight. But God's going to let them get harder as time goes on. Am I telling the truth to some of y'all know this? They get a little harder as time goes on, but you're able to handle it better than you used to be. Because you know how God brought you through. So that's the point of God being faithful to us. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. God's a faithful creator. Somebody say amen. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings, Lord, tonight. Lord, I thank you for seeing all these people here tonight. It blesses my soul. I thank you, Lord, for the people that are uh, with us watching online. And Lord, I know, God, that we've been through a week already, half the week. And some people need a blessing. Some people, Lord, that have been out rubbing shoulders with the world all week. They've been vexed by it. It's got them. And maybe they don't feel as holy as they did Sunday. Maybe they don't feel as righteous as they did a few days ago. And God, they just need to know, Father, that you still love them, that you still care about them, that you know that we live in this very perverted world. And even, even God, you were with Lot in his compromising positions that he put himself in in Sodom. You were with him and you saved him out of that. And so God, let that be somebody's example tonight. God, that maybe they've compromised a little bit with the world. Done things that they said they wouldn't do anymore, didn't want to do anymore. And I pray, God, that you would help each and every one and just lift them up tonight. But, Father, we thank you, God, for teaching us how to be faithful by your faithfulness. Teach us that. Be our role model. The one we look up to. Father, I thank you, Lord, for giving me good people in my life. People that, as I grew up, I wanted to be like them. And they were good people. They were good men. And I pray, dear God, that you would help me, Lord, because I don't think I'm there yet where they were. And I pray, Lord, that you would help me and help all these people tonight. Thank you, Lord, for even in the worst of our afflictions, God, we thank you for being faithful to us. And for never letting go of our hand. We love you tonight. And bless us as we journey through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2. Um, I, I know I probably touched on this a little bit last Wednesday night, but I want to launch from here and move forward. We're talking about a faithful God. And in the verses previous to this, we saw how God and the word... The word is faithful. It is a faithful word. In fact, I just said a while ago, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How can you have faith if you don't have the word of God? How can anybody believe? I'll, I'll put it to you like this. How can anybody believe in the right Jesus? How can anybody believe in the right Savior if they're not being led that way by the right word of God? That Bible is faith. God is faithful to us through his word. God promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And as long as our Bible's with us, that verse is true. That saying is true. God is as good as his word is good. We judge people on this earth by their word to us. If a man gives us his word and he abides faithful to that word, even at his own loss, we have respect to that person. We have respect to that man because that man gave his word. And you know what? I know it cost him, but he was he was faithful to his word. And and we'll honor that. I don't know how some of y'all are, but I don't work on cars too very well much at all. Probably because the first several times I worked on cars, I threw all my tools and then couldn't find them. I don't like working on my car, but I've had people. I remember the first time I took, after Lisa and I got married as a young man, and I took our, my car, the, my work car, to get it inspected. And the guy, I'm telling you, that guy tried to get me, Brother George. He tried to get me. He said, oh, you're, oh I'm, gonna, I'm gonna not going to pass your car. I said, why? He said, your ball joints are all messed up. And I went, oh, boy. And I acted like I knew what ball joints were. And he did something in there. He said, see, these ball joints are all bad. There was just something about that, Sterling. I did not, I guess the Holy Ghost is saying, Mike, don't trust. You know, I left that man. I said, you know what? I'll, I'll come back at a later time to have you fix them. I left there and went down the street to another garage and they looked at it and they said, you're all fine. You're good. Here you go. And I went, did you check the ball joints? He said, yeah, they're fine. I, went, I knew it. Where are those, by the way? So I know next time. And you know what? 
I said, I'll never go back to that garage ever again. You can charge me higher than anybody in town. But if I trust you, you're going to get my business every single time. Because it's worth it to me to have a man to work on my car that I trust. That man is good as his word. I know if he says this is wrong, and there, we, Sterling and I both, we traded with a guy there in Hillsborough and until I don't know what happened to him, but we traded him. He he fixed our cars for years because I trusted the man, and to my knowledge, he never did me wrong. And that's God. God is a faithful witness to us, and His word is faithful. And this is why a lot of you people have never left the King James Bible because you have gone back to it time after time after time and you found that God's word has always been faithful to you. Somebody say amen. Even if it said what you didn't want to hear, God's word was faithful to you. So we know God is faithful to his word. He's faithful in his sayings. But then he's faithful as the high priest. First Samuel 2.35, I will raise me up a faithful priest. That shall do that which is according in, in mine heart and in my mind. You see, in Samuel's day, they were, they had dealt with Eli, who was the high priest and the judge, and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were corrupt. And everybody despised the temple of the Lord because of Hophni and Phinehas. I wonder, out of all the people in our community that have said, I'll never go to church again because they're all full of hypocrites. I wonder how many of those people are saying something that's actually true because they were abused or hurt or damaged or lied to in some way by a church in this town. I, I believe that churches have done people wrong and they don't trust them anymore. And this is why they won't go back to one anymore. But, and then, then Samuel's two sons. They were unfaithful, just like Hophni and uh, Phinehas. And so God said, I'm going to raise me up a faithful priest. So Hebrews 2, 17, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful, watch this, a merciful and faithful high priest. In things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. If there's one thing that we don't need when we come to God is judgment on us because we have already been judged. That's why we come to God. I mean, if somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, I want you to elect me to a high office in the church because I'm a good person and I never do anything wrong. I'm automatically suspicious of that person. But you got a guy that comes and says, Pastor, I, want, I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray for me because I'm, I'm rotten and I'm in this world trying to get to me and I don't like it. Uh, will, will you help me out? I'll help that man. I'll pray with that man. I'll honor that man. He doesn't need my condemnation. He already feels the condemnation of his sins. And he wants things right. So when he goes to the high priest, Jesus Christ, he knows that God is going to be... A, every time I've gone to God, he's been merciful to me. Name the sin that you committed that God did not forgive you of. Doesn't exist. He's a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Make reconciliation for the sins of the people. If you come to Jesus Christ, know that, I mean, 1 John 1, 9, what does it say? If we confess our sins, He, faithful and just. Uh, I know I got that in here somewhere. Hebrews 3, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful. To him that appointed him. Uh, this is one of my favorite, one of my favorite things in the whole Bible. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Y'all, you guys pray for a man that I hurt his feelings today. I wasn't trying to. But he called me a, a while back and was saying some things to me that I just... I wasn't following. It just didn't sound right. So we followed up today with a phone call. He may be listening today. I want you to know I love you. But I stand firm on what I said. He was trying to convince me that he knew the day and the hour of the Lord's return. And I said, I'm reading the Bible right here in Matthew chapter 24. It says, no man knoweth the day or the hour. And he said, well, it doesn't mean that. And I said, are you telling me, are you telling me right now that you know the day, the hour and the year? He said, I know the year too. 
And I said, I'm looking at the Bible and saying, no, you don't. And we kind of went round and round for a while. And he said some things, several things to me that I knew were not in the scriptures. And he said, well, you know, the Jews had this tradition. I said, the Jewish tradition, Jesus berated the Jews because of their tradition. He said, you made the word of God of none effect with your tradition. So Hebrews chapter 10. Here's Jesus. And verse five, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, isn't that something that I guess it's the apostle Paul writes Hebrews. Maybe it wasn't. But whoever wrote it knew the very words that Jesus said before he ever came down to this world the first time. Because the Holy Ghost told him what they were. When he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me, in burnt offerings and sacrifices, for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Verse 9, then he said, lo, I come to do thy will. Oh God, he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. But Christ said it. Christ said, when I come into the world, everything that's written in the book, I'm going to do it. This is what sets Jesus apart from people like me and you. Because we don't do everything that's in the book. But Christ is faithful. He didn't violate the law. He was unspotted from sin. He had no transgressions laid upon him. Pilate said, I, I don't have anything to accuse this man of. As far as I'm concerned, he can go free. He found no offense in him whatsoever. Jesus does it by the book. So I posted this on Facebook today. It's rule number one. There's two rules when it comes to Bible prophecy. Rule number one, no man knows the day or the hour. Rule number two, if you get a call from somebody saying they know the day and the hour, refer them to rule number one. No man knows the day or the hour. By the book. Jesus, as a high priest, was faithful and obedient to the commandments of God, and he does everything he does by the book. I'm going to record, if God allow me tomorrow, I'm going to record the next Watchman broadcast. And I'm going to deal with a word that I've heard used multiple times in all kinds of churches and in all kinds of Christian settings. That is so unbiblical that it scares me when I hear people talk about it. The Shekinah glory is not in the Bible. Not there. It's not in the English translation. It's not in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's not in the Hebrew Old Testament. Shekinah is a feminine noun. And is, see the Jews, God told the Jews to go to Babylon, don't learn the religions now. And they went, what religions? And they went in there and learned. You know what they found out? They found out that the God, the Babylonians, had a female girlfriend that he fornicated with. And the Jews had it in their mind. Well, you know, we saw in the days of Moses where God, uh, fought, God was with the Israelites in the cloud. But that's impossible because God is everywhere. God cannot be in one particular place. That's how stupid they were, excuse me, blind they were. So they adopted this doctrine that God's presence on this earth was his female consort called Shekinah. There is a picture of Shekinah in the Sistine Chapel that Michelangelo painted. That ceiling, you seen that? You seen God reaching down from heaven, touching Adam on the finger to give him life, which is not in the Bible either. God didn't touch Adam's finger. He didn't say, Adam, let me pull your finger. I'm going to bring you to life. He didn't say that. And in that picture, God has his left arm around a bare-breasted, red-headed woman. Shekinah. That's who that is. When the preachers aren't faithful, 
God will be. When this preacher is not faithful, God will be. Don't, if you get upset with me over something, don't take that out on God. Men fail other people. Preachers fail church members. God doesn't. Amen? He's faithful. Jeremiah 42, 5. Then they said to Jeremiah, the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. I covered that last week. I want to move on. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. I thank my God always. I'll count down to 5, 4, 3, 2. I'll let you get there. 1 Corinthians 1. I thank my God always in your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. That in everything, how many things does everything cover? Everything. That in everything you are enriched by him. Jesse Duplantis will take that and see, 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 you're supposed to be rich, John. You're supposed to be rich, supposed to be wealthy. In everything you are enriched by him. I am rich, just not in money. I'm rich by God's mercy. And everything you're enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes we get tired of waiting, don't we? They're releasing new emojis this week. Did you hear that? I saw a little bit on the news this morning. On your text messages, you're getting a whole new set of emojis. You know what those are. Emotion G's or whatever. Little pictures that you can send to people that describe your emotions about something they said or what's going on in your life. And what came across the screen this morning, Jared, was... These two boyfriends holding hands, these two boyfriends holding hands, these two boyfriends holding hands, these two girlfriends holding hands, these two girlfriends holding hands. Huh? Yeah, the new set of emojis has LGBTQRNSTP PDQ emojis now to honor all of those who are sodomites. And I did what you did, George. I shook my head. I said, God, how long? How long? God's going to take care of it. God's going to do it. Let's wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's be faithful while we wait. Verse 8. Who shall, watch this now. Who shall also confirm you unto the end. Words mean something. The word confirm. Con means with. Firm means... Not going nowhere. Who gets, be honest, who in here gets shaky in your walk with Christ every now and then? Thank you for your honesty. He's not demanding that you confirm God. God is confirming you. God will always let you know He's not going to let go of you. You've heard me say this. I've, I've said it year after year after year. When things are well with you, that's when you spend time with God, begging God to hold on to you when things are not well with you. Because both are going to come. Both are going to happen. And while you're doing well, our nature is to not pray as much when things are well. And not read as much when things are well. But it's a good exercise, a good habit, that when things are well, that you spend some time with God asking Him to hold on to you when things are not well with you. He will, be, he will confirm you unto when? The end. You see, 
when he gives us, Brother James, our new bodies, we won't need to be confirmed anymore. We won't need a King James Bible to carry around. We won't need to attend church services. We won't need prayer time. We won't need to fast. We won't need to do those things because God is going to eliminate sin. He's going to give us a new body. He's going to take away death. He's going to take away pain and suffering. He's going to take away everything that is part of this world down here. And we won't need that anymore. We'll have it. But here, we need it. Take advantage of it. Who shall confirm you into the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. Present tense. Right now, God is faithful. And if you read that five minutes from now, you're going to read it the same way. God is faithful. And if you read it five months from now, you're going to read it the same way. God is faithful. By whom you were called under the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Say this out loud with me. God is faithful. Say it again. God is faithful. You see, both times it was the same thing, wasn't it? Two seconds ago, God was faithful. Now he's still faithful. First Corinthians 10, 13. I like this. Did you ever feel like as things were happening to you, that obviously you're the only one that this has ever happened to. Right? See, all you guys laughing, I know, that was you. There is no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. Now, is your Bible right or not? But God is what? Say it out loud again. God is... Let's see, that was 1 Corinthians 1, and nine chapters later, God's still faithful. God is faithful, who will not suffer, he suffer means allow you to be tempted above that you are able. Here's how God will keep you in the hour of temptation. Will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape. Even if it means losing your coat. Losing your coat. What story am I talking about? Joseph and Potiphar's wife. When Joseph was in Potiphar's house, he had been getting everything. Potiphar didn't even know what he had. He didn't know what he had other than the food that was sitting in front of him three times a day. And Potiphar's wife was a whore. She was Jezebel. She was Mystery Babylon. She was the strange woman. And she kept putting her paws all over that nice young buck, Joseph. And when she said, lie with me, I'm going to show you the integrity of a man. Who, when she said, lie with me, said, you know what? Your husband has given everything into my hand. There's nothing that is your husband's that is not already mine except you. And I'm not touching you. Joseph had it good. And he was faithful. I'll be honest with you. In today's world, most men jump on Potiphar's wife. Am I right? I didn't say you. I made it very generic. Most men in today's world would not pass that up but Joseph did and when he ran out that was God see there's an illustration for every doctrine in your Bible and Joseph is this illustration right here God made a way of escape to leave out of there okay now did Joseph suffer wrongfully but I want you to think about it had Joseph not suffered at the hands of Potiphar's wife, he would have never gone to prison. Had he never gone to prison, he would have never interpreted the dream of the baker and the butler. Had he never interpreted the dream of the baker and the butler, the butler would not have then told Pharaoh, ah, I knew a guy in prison that interprets dreams, and I think he's still there. I mean, that was like five times removed away from it, 
But had Joseph slept with Potiphar's wife, his own brethren would have died in the famine. That's God being faithful. And God providing you a way of escape out of your temptation. And even if you suffer as a result of it. Let me tell you something. There have been men and women who have in their conscience has stood up against their company or their boss for what was right and suffered as a result of that. But notice how Joseph ended up. Joseph, because he owns practically everything that Potiphar has, he got a promotion. Now Joseph owns everything in the whole world is in his hand. You see how it works? If God's faithful, maybe you can try to be faithful too, guys. Try it. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That's a long jump, so I'll give you a minute to get there. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. So I want you to think about this. If you've ever been worried that since we don't know the day and the hour of the coming of our Lord, the glorious appearing, since we don't know that day and hour, I imagine it's probably normal for all of us to maybe in a time of doubt say, uh, I hope when that day comes that I'm doing good. I mean, I'd hate to be caught in a bar as a Christian when the Lord comes. Or I'd hate to be cussing a guy out who got in front of me in the car. Or I'd hate to be thinking about being unfaithful to my wife. Or I'd hate to be lying to my parents or whatever. I'd hate to be doing that when the Lord comes. I hope I'm right. You have it in your Bible that God promises to preserve you blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have a promise in your Bible that God promises you. Now, how does he do that? He does it how, the same way he saves you. By the remission of your sins. So you had blame on you as a sinner. Christ removed that. Now you are sinless. Even though you did something wrong. Christ removed the sins that you committed that were against you. He nailed them to his cross. And now you are now blameless before God. And God promises. And he's faithful to do it. If, and that verse we quoted a while ago. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I believe that God will preserve me blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the conversation I had with the man today, I, I tried to be gentle with him. And I said, look, brother, I said, I'm going to be honest with you. When God called me in this ministry back in 1997, I, the first thing I did, I jumped into trying to find out the day and the hour. And I didn't do nothing but study, try to figure out the day and the hour. That was in me. And finally, after a year, God said, Mike, stop. That's in my hands. Don't worry about it. I got it taken care of. Study these things here. Get busy with something. I got far greater things I want you to do. I want you to study this. So God pulled me out of that. And I will be honest with you. I have not given. I wouldn't say no thought. Zero thought. But the thought about when the Lord's coming. I don't think about it much anymore. I believe. And I'm saying this now because I feel good. I believe God will preserve me blameless. There will be times, maybe in the future, where 
I may not be willing to say that very loudly, but it still exists. God will preserve us all blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's faithful people. Amen. Look at this, 2 Thessalonians 3. Now, 2 Thessalonians is in the context of the falling away. Brother Brian came in and was telling us about this church that had to fold. It's not because they were doing something wrong. They love the Bible. But they had to fold because the apostasy in this area is great. It's huge. People who say they want to start going to church, they don't, they don't seek out a King James only church. They don't out, seek out a church where they still preach the Bible and still try to live by the way the Bible teaches us. They don't seek those things out. They're seeking out programs and what the, what that church has to offer them and what that church has to do for them. And, and, the, and they seek that out. And the apostasy is great in this area. The falling away is being set up right now. So in that context, that's 2 Thessalonians 2. In chapter 3, verse 1, finally, brethren, and this is even after Paul has said, um, what's verse 11? 2 Thessalonians 2, 11. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Well, what did Jesus say? He said, if it was possible, they would deceive the very elect. But you know what that means? Not possible. The dece whatever deception that Satan has planned and God's going to turn everybody over to, he has reserved his people. And he will not allow them to believe it. Their mind won't be affected by it. They will not be afflicted by it. So that's chapter 3. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. And I would ask you all to do that for our church. That the word of God may have a free course as it goes out pray that youtube don't kick us off pray that sermon audio don't kick us off <laughs> pray that hey we already have enemies out in kenya that have already said we're going to close your radio station down pray that they don't close us down pray that we have free course that the word of god may have, have free course and be glorified even as it is with you do you see what paul's saying here he's talked about the bible Pray that the Bible's glorified. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful. Who will establish you. And keep you from evil. What's your worst fear? Everybody look up here for a minute. As you're looking at me, I want you to think about your biggest fear as far as sin goes with you, with you. What is it that you are afraid of most? That the devil knows how to pull a certain string with you and tempt you with a very evil, wicked sin. You thinking about it? Don't tell me. Don't tell me what it is. Verse 3. Keep you from evil. God, don't let me do that. God put a fence around me. Chain me up. Don't let me do that. Amen. God is faithful. And the thing, the thing that you fear the most, I believe God will keep you. I believe he will. You got to trust him though. You got to trust him. Because he always knows how to deal with you. He always knows how to handle you. He always knows what barriers you need. He always knows what doors he can open. But he also knows how long your chain needs to be your leash. God put a hit. We sang a wall of fire about me. I've nothing now to fear. 
right? We just sang that, right? I have a wall of fire about me. I have nothing now to fear. A wall of fire that God sets around his people. And he says, I'm going to keep you from all that evil. Amen.